Thank you very much. Let's see if I can make this work. Yeah, I mean, it's quite something, and I'm just listening here. I mean, to, I mean, the function of life is to keep people healthy and then they may let them be healthy enough so they can do something. And now I'm going to try to tell you a much more modest thing than uh, about what was done by a large group of people who were healthy enough to do it, okay? And uh, the, this is now this, uh, what we actually measured with gravitational waves. And it comes from the Einstein theory of general relativity, which was developed in... 1915, and it was a development that came and replaced the Newton theory. It, developed, it was a geometric theory. It replaced gravitational forces and made them into the geometry of space and time. And in the process of doing that, and I won't go into any more deeper than that, it also predicted that there would not be instantaneous communication from one place in a gravitational field to another. And that was a very important thing, so because you couldn't have information going faster than the velocity of light. So something had to be built in the theory that had that, and that is gravitational waves. I'm going to start by showing you what a gravitational wave is. And uh, first, first I'll tell you the most minuscule, I mean, the most important parts of it are that gravitational waves move, or we believe, and we now think we even know, that they travel at the velocity of light. They're generated by accelerating masses, masses that accelerate. So things that do that are motions where there are collisions or where things go around each other. Those are accelerated motions. They make gravitational waves. And uh, here is what I want to show you is you, this is a gravitational wave. It's a distortion of space when I get this animation moving. But I want you, before I do that, to recognize what you're seeing. You're seeing a bunch of dots that mensurate space. I mean, these are dots of things. And you're standing right here with this red dot. And now I'm going to turn this thing on. And this is the motion a gravitational wave exerts perpendicular to the direction in which it's moving. In other words, uh, what you're seeing here is a compression of space in one dimension at the same time as an expansion of space in the perpendicular dimension. And that is all coming at you or going into the, into the screen. There's another attribute of this thing. Uh, you'll see that two dots, like these two right there, are not moving very much relative to each other. But these two dots, which are here, are moving a lot. And you'll see this all over the picture. Things that are close together don't move very much. Separate, their separation doesn't change much, but the things that are separated by large distances move a lot. And that is a picture of something called a strain, a change in position. That's the change in position divided by the separation or the length. That is a constant quantity at any one instant in that picture. And that, in fact, is a gravitational wave. That's what, it's a strain in space. Now, the way you might measure that I want to quickly walk you through. And this was the, one of the ideas that was done. And there were other ideas that were done, but this is something that actually is the type of detector that made the detection. And what this is is a little picture we will follow in a minute. Here is a laser that's going to put out a beam of light. Light will hit this beam splitter, which is a device like a half-silvered mirror, where light is reflected from it and goes to a mirror here and is reflected back again and eventually comes back goes through this device and hits this mirror. I mean, hits this detector. Then there's another beam that does the same thing. It's transmitted by this, goes to that mirror, comes back, is reflected, and goes to the same detector. These two beams, this is called an interferometer, and you will now see what, this, what the action is. The action is that here's the light. Wherever there's this wiggly thing is the electric field in the light. The red implies where there is light that your eye can see. So there's light all along that path. There's light all along that path, and the electric fields come here, and when they pass this point, they, you notice they're opposite in sign, they cancel. There is no red here, no light gets to the photodetector. The reason is because these two paths are the same. Now they get wiggled, like what you saw with those dots. This moves in, that one moves out, and you'll see that the light appears there when the paths are no longer actually exactly equal. And that is indeed, what you're just seeing there, the basis for the whole detection. It's not more subtle than that. It's much, much simpler than the cells and proteins I was just looking at. <laughs> uh, and, uh, what it, what, uh, but the thing that makes it hard isn't the concepts are straightforward. What makes it hard is the problem that when you start, like my, the, 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 Kip Thorne is going to talk to you in a minute, will tell you, and he was one of the first to tell you, that if this a gravitational wave, if you want to see one from something that's going on in the universe someplace, you're going to have to do this extremely well. It's not just, you have to do it so well 
that you can measure a strain, which is, we'll call that H, and you'll, that, no, that is a, a way of talking about it, and that's this delta L over L, you have to do better than 10 to the minus 21. Now, that's terribly small. And for example, the detector that was built and that made the detection was four kilometers long. And so when you multiply four kilometers, or 4,000 meters, by uh, this 10 to the minus 21, you'll get something like 10 to the minus 18. So now I'm going to give you a little feel for 10 to the minus 18. Most people, when this was proposed, thought this was completely insane. You could not do something like this. And uh, in fact, it, well, for a long time, we couldn't. And so I want to give you a feel for it. Uh, a meter, I, I wish we used meters, but unfortunately, it's about three feet, OK? Uh, <laughs> the, uh, uh, it, well, you know, here's a thing that gets you from one meter to 10 to the minus 18. Let's take a few steps in, in this sort of dendrite here. Well, a human hair is one, you have to divide the meter by 10,000. That you still understand. And if you want to get down to a light, for example, light that you just barely can see, this is infrared light, you divide by another 100, you're down to one millionth of a meter now, one micron. A visible light that you like is about five times, is one half of that, that's green, green light. And you have to divide by another 10,000, and you get down to the size of an atom. And that's something you can just about still do. And you can do that with a medicine dropper and a little drop of, in, in, the, in the medicine dropper and a big tub of water, and drop that drop, which you measured the vo volume of, drop it into the water, and see the area that's, that, that it spreads out on. And from that height, you get the height of an atom. And that's, you can still do on your own, but then we're stuck. You can divide by another 100,000, and you have to get to this inside of an atom, and that's the nucleus of an atom. You can't see that directly, and people have a lot of trouble, but you make machines that do that. But you're still not there. You have to divide by another 1,000. So this is, the, this is the challenge that came from it, and it's something which is an interesting challenge. It says that we're, using, we're going to use light to do the measurement, but you're going to measure, which is at 10 to the minus 6, and we need to measure at 10 to the minus 18. So you have a huge factor to go. 10 to the 12 has to be gotten somehow. And the way that was done, and the one of the people who is not with us today, who is sick, but also got the Breakthrough Award, is Ronald Drever. And he invented many of these ideas. And the idea is, this is the actual device that made the detection. It's much more complicated looking. Here's the laser. I'll show you the parts you already know. Here's the laser, there's the beam splitter, and there are those two distant mirrors. But some things have been added. Here's two mirrors, which are fairly easy to explain. What they do is they take the light and bounce it back and forth many times, and they also bounce it back and forth many times in here, so that you get many shots at measuring that. That gets you a factor of about 100 to maybe even 300 in this process. And then uh, you, this laser is, uh, well, the laser is important in the whole thing. It, we'll get to what that does. But there's an interesting thing that happens. If there's no light going to this photodetector, all that light goes back to the, to the laser. And you can make a device, which is another interferometer, which divides that light up in such a way that the laser light that would be reflected by this mirror and the light that comes back from the interferometer interfere with each other at that point so no light gets back to the laser. And that's called a power recycling mirror. And that's one of the ideas that Drever and others had, a very important idea for this. And then there's another, which is much more subtle. This is a more subtle idea. I want to tell you what it does. I'm not going to be able to demonstrate it to you. And that is, it changes the spectral response of the, of the interferometer. So the other place, we have already gotten a factor of about a couple of hundred out of the bouncing. And with the laser, we, we start with a 25-watt laser. You might, this, with this trick, with this extra mirror, you might build up to 500 watts in here. And you might build up to half a megawatt of light in there. And that extra amount, when you start looking at it and look at the number of photons are involved, gets you the 10 to the 12, all those factors together. So you now know how to sense well enough the position of these mirrors, but we don't know that the mirrors are standing still to that position, and they definitely aren't until you have to do another whole bunch of stuff. And the stuff you have to do is right now you and I are all jiggling up and down by about a micron, maybe even more than that, two or maybe 10 microns here in the city. So you have another factor of about 10 to the 12 or 10 to the 13 to fight. And that's the really hard one. And some ideas, are, here's one thing that's done, is for example, people, here's that mirror, you hang that mirror from pendulum, and that, hung, and that mirror is hung from another one and another one. These are, these are just more masses. And so multiple suspensions are used. And so that's one way it's done. Another tricky thing, which you guys might be interested in, especially people in microscopes, microscopes and biology, wow 
uh, and that is that uh, you, you actually make a platform that measures the noise and then kills it by forcing the noise to go to zero by driving the, the, ta the, the table it's on. It's very much like those uh, earphones that kill the noise in your, when you're flying in an airplane, you know, the noise-canceling headphones. So there are two detectors, uh, one in uh, Louisiana and another one in Hanford, and uh, that's in Washington. There are two detectors, and here's a quick uh, sort of a little tour through the detectors. Uh, this is in, this is, that, that's, that was Hanford, that was Livingston, this is Hanford, it's a desert. Here's this beam tube that's four kilometers long. And this is a culvert that covers it. This is in Louisiana. And uh, here's what that thing looks like. This is evacuated to 10 to minus 9 tour. And here are people working on a laser table at the, at, in one of the buildings at the end. And here is the control room for the detector itself. And people are learning how to run the device. It's not so easy. It has an enormous complexity in terms of all the different servo systems that are involved inside of it. And here, then, is the detection that was made by that system uh, back in September of a, a, a September 2015. And uh, this is, uh, the, the, I, I will walk you through this a little bit. You may have seen this in the newspapers, but uh, th this, this is the signal. That what we're seeing here is time. Time is on this axis. Whoops. Uh, okay. Time is this axis. It's the same on all of them. And this is amplitude of strain. And this is 10 to the minus 21 strain, right there. And here is a signal that there's noise over here, but it slowly develops. There's a very coherent thing in here. And uh, that, that's the signal that was seen at, at Hanford. And here is the signal, the blue, is the signal that was seen at Livingston. And it doesn't look exactly the same, but it's within the noise damn near the same. And this, this is noise, and that's noise. Here, are, and they were filtered. This was filtered by a filter that is much like the tone controls on an audio set that you might have. The low frequencies were killed off, and the high frequencies were killed off, so that you made it easy. But this was, you could see this signal. We didn't expect to be able to do that. You could see this signal directly on a piece of paper. You didn't have to do a hell of a lot of processing to get it. And here is the, uh, the theory, the Einstein theory, predicting what we think is the, the source. It's, it turns out to be, as we'll see in a minute, two black holes that are going around each other. And uh, they would give, if you now solve that problem with the Einstein field equations, you will get something with this filter included that looks like this very smooth curve here. And uh, it's all the same here. And the difference between what we saw and the predicted curve, once you know what the parameters are, is this sort of white-looking thing. That's just the noise. And down here is a spectral representation of it, how it appears and as a function of frequency. For example, the piano, sort of the range of the piano is where this goes on. This is shorter than the range, but this is sort of the base, the lowest note on the piano is a little over this, but 32 hertz, and here's middle C sort of right there. And there's more to go. We have other sources that go way higher. So it goes, uh, makes a chirp like this, and the brightest is where the sound is loudest. And this is the one at uh, Hanford, and this is the one at Livingston. They're not quite the same in amplitude. And that is the discovery. And here is what the discovery implied to us. Um, yeah. And here it looks flatter, but this is the actual theory. It's done both. And one of the prize winners yesterday is a, a group, uh, 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 Franz Pretorius, was the one who finally really made it so that you could do, make a computer give us these wave shapes. And that's the red curve that's in here. And this is then a analytic things, the things that are dark behind their analytic methods of doing it. And this then is, what does it represent? And Kip will tell you more about this. But these are two black holes. They weigh 30, we'll see in a minute. They're big black holes. They're getting closer and faster. They're getting closer to each other as they move along like this. You can see their spacing gets smaller. It's higher and higher frequency. And at a point right about in there, they merge and make a new black hole. And that is the first time we've ever seen such a thing. And we, in fact, we've never seen black holes in pairs before. And sort of all the gee whiz stuff in here, for example, here's a curve that shows you the velocity, the relative velocity of these two, just as they're, as they're going around and then when they hit each other. So here's about the third the velocity of light of a thing that weighs 20 to t well, maybe 30 times the mass of the sun. There it is. And here at the end point when they smash into each other, it's about, let's say, a little over half the velocity of light. So you're almost doing particle physics with these gigantic astrophysical objects. And, that, and then what happened after that is we, this is now a curve which is, that, is the same curve, but now it turns out that by more subtle methods than just looking 
at the oscilloscopes and other, but with matching waveforms, which Pip will tell you a little about also, you can look deep into the noise of that system and find other sources, and we did. And here's the one I was just talking about. It's that very big black hole. Here's the masses, 36 to 29, and the change in the energy of the whole system, or the change in the mass, the final mass of the black hole, is not the sum of those two. It's three solar masses less, and all of that energy went into gravitational waves. It's an unbelievable collision. I mean, that, that whole collision shone more in the universe at that instant than all the light and all the radio waves and all the electromagnetic waves in the universe for something like 0.2 seconds. It's a one hell of a collision. And uh, so this is, one, uh, this is another one we're sure of. So it goes at a different frequency. There's smaller masses, and it lasts much longer. That's a true chirp. chirp. And this is one we think we, well, we saw it, but we're not 100% sure of it. These have sort of, uh, sure than this is a five sigma that has no, that is sort of 85% probably right. Okay, last, I just want to show some pictures of people. Uh, these are people who are critical to this whole thing. This is Barry Barish, who ran the project at the end, made it happen. Stan Whitcomb, who's been on this project for years. He's a, he was a chief scientist. And Barry brought uh, Gary Sanders, who was the project manager for it. Here are two key people. He's now the deputy director of LIGO, Al, Al Lazzarini. He comes from San Francisco, by the way. And here's uh, uh, Dennis Coyne, who is the chief engineer. And you'll see their faces, but they get younger as we go along. Uh, uh, <laughs> And what happens, these are people who are spokespeople of the LIGO scientific collaboration. Uh, people, that we have a collaboration of 1,000 people, for 50 or so institutions. He, he was the first elected spokesperson of it, Peter Salson. And then David Reitze was the next one. And the one you probably, if you listen to the press conference, Gab Gabriela Gonzalez actually was the one who made the announcement of this enormous discovery. And here are the people who, who actually worked and made it happen. And now you look a lot younger, you notice? And uh, this is Dennis Coyne again, who is the engineer. But here is David Shoemaker, who is was sort of in charge of the whole project for making the, sec the, the second detector we put into it. And, uh, he, and, he, and Peter Fritschel was in charge of orchestrating the, the actual commissioning of the detector. And these two, Valera Froloff and da Daniel Sig, were the people who were on site at those two sites and made the detector work with an army of people. So those are the people for responsible. And one thing, since now, I'm now three minutes over, which where Kip's going to get mad at me. Uh, and here is something that uh, I saw when I got to New York right after the announcement, and it was already in the, in the subway in New York, and these are people sitting in the, in the subway. And they say, scientists were able to find black holes. I can sort of paraphrase it, but you know, it's much harder to find an apartment with a walk-in closet in New York City, <laughs> okay? So, I mean, this is days after we made the announcement. It's sort of amazing how that got into the public conscience. Here's a, here is a, uh, a cartoon from the New Yorker magazine. I mean, here are two birds. Uh, this one's telling the other one, was that you I heard just now, or was it two black holes colliding? So, I mean, it chirps. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Not as bad, but